Welcome to Interparty Conflict, the podcast where we answer your questions so you can have the best tabletop gaming experience possible. My name is Gabe. My name is Jeff. And we're going to answer your questions today. But first, I have a question. Jeff. Yeah. How are you doing today? I'm doing okay. Uh, we got we got groceries yesterday and we got ice cream. So I had some ice cream <laughs> earlier. And it that's, was delicious. that's pretty exciting. <laughs> so. Yeah, I say that like it's a special treat. Every time we get groceries, we get like a little thing of ice cream, just because like everyone needs a treat right now, sure. all the time. Sure, treat. Find a way to treat yourself, because you know times are tough right now. So, yeah. How, how about you? How you doing? Uh, I'm doing pretty good. Pretty good. It's uh, so this is episode 199. Ooh. We are very very close to episode 200. Uh huh. One away, in fact. Um, <laughs> One away, in fact, yes. And uh, and then, you know, then we'll be in our fifth year of doing this podcast. That's ridiculous, Gabe. That, that is ridiculous. Like, that's that's too many years of podcasting. <laughs> right. There was a time when we weren't doing a podcast, and now it has yeah. been... How long did you just say? Well, it'll be our fifth year. Right. So, we, well, so we we've are... been doing it for four years. For four years, yes. It's ridiculous. I confused myself with that a year ago, if that's, I recall. It's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> and a thing that's especially ridiculous is that when we started this podcast, you know, I, I have been listening to a lot of podcasts for a long time. I had been listening to podcasts for a year or so by the time we started this. And I don't know if any of the podcasts I was listening to at that time had been around for four years. Mm. Like there were some that were close. Like one of them that I listened to is uh, it's called Watch Out for Fireballs. It's a um, oh, yeah. video game podcast. Yeah. And I think... They're coming up on eight years. Maybe they've just barely passed eight years, but, um, but like I, four years even then, was like that's a ton of time. Mm -hmm. And you know there are some podcasts that have that I do listen to that have been going the entire time we've been going too. But like even still, like all of these podcasts that I looked up to as being like oh man they've been on forever we're on for like a year. <laughs> two years right. six months you know sure it's crazy yeah been pretty pretty consistent for four years <laughs> that's yeah. yeah i mean you know you do forget about that that it's like oh yeah i have been doing a thing <laughs> it's like there, right, there, there has right. there has been a thing i've been doing yeah i'm i'm glad we've been doing it it's been yeah. a lot of fun no yeah i've been i'm having a blast and well, so speaking of of episode episode numbers of two hundred, uh, Crit Academy just recorded their two hundredth episode. Ooh! Um, so big congratulations to them. I think because they they record a couple weeks ahead of time, um, and they they stream all their episodes, so I was able to catch like the very very end of it. But uh, I think that should be going out. If not the week this goes out, it might be going out the following week. Following week, but uh, but yeah, huge congratulations to Crit Academy. They've been they've been doing it longer than we have. They've taken a few more weeks off than we have though oh, so I, gotcha. we, I actually i thought we were ahead of them for a moment i th i think we we might have been at one point but right. then like we we took a week off a few weeks ago and anyway but yeah. uh <laughs> yeah big congratulations to them they've been doing a great job uh for for the last uh four plus years as well mm -hmm. so yeah um and then uh one more quick thing before we actually get into this episode uh, in just a couple days after this goes out is going to be the deadline for our listener submissions episode. Hopefully, uh, I'm, I'm with last week's episode. Hopefully I made it clear what it was that I wanted, uh, from that. If not, you know, no worries. We'll put out whatever we have, but if listeners, if you want to get your voice on our podcast, you can do so. You only have a couple days to do so now, but you know, get a mic, use your phone, whatever, record something. Say hi to us, say hi to a friend, say, tell us about your favorite character, your favorite campaign, uh, whatever, anything that you would like to record and have on the airwaves projected out from our podcast studio, because uh -huh. that's a thing. Uh, you know, if you want, if you want your voice on our podcast, you can get it on here. So go ahead and just send in whatever, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so, so get that to us. The deadline's coming up in just a couple days. So. Enough of all of that, Jeff. You want to go ahead and uh, and jump into this episode? Yeah, let's do that. Episode 199. Ooh. Okay. So, Jeff, I want you to imagine that you're, uh, you, you step into the tavern. Mm -hmm. And you sit down at the bar, and, you know, the bartender is a little busy. But you notice that there's, there's a little glass bottle 
sitting on the bar right in front of you, and it's got a little note on it, and it says free on it. Just like somebody stuck a little little notepad, a little sticky note on there, a little magical sticky note on this bottle, and it says free on it. Sweet free drink. Yep. Um, uh, I'm going to grab it. Okay, I'm going to open up that bottle. Okay. So you go and you you unstopper the bottle and you think to yourself, hey, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, I've been here a lot. I've been coming here a long time. Maybe I'm getting some free stuff finally. You uncork, you uncork the bottle and suddenly you feel an intense rush of wind as you feel yourself flying through the air, twirling, twisting, spinning, flipping, whatever. Next thing you know, you hit the ground hard and you look around you and you are in some sort of a giant glass chamber. Ooh. And then you look up, you look up above you and the ceiling is the top of a bottle and someone is shoving a cork into the top of the bottle. Oh and no. And you realize you are now trapped inside this bottle and the bottle gets jostled. You kind of like, I'll say you, you get knocked out or something. And when you come to, you, you rub your eyes like they do in cartoons. Then you look out through the glass <laughs> bottle and you see gold and you see rubies and you see all sorts of, of shining and glowing and, and all sorts of, of treasure of magical and non-magical nature. And you realize that this bottle has been taken somewhere. Do you know, that, do you know where that bottle has been taken, Jeff? Where, where, where am I? <laughs> you are now trapped in the Dragon's Horde. <laughs> Wait, does that make me a genie now? Am I like a genie in a bottle? Uh, roll a d20. It's gonna rub me the right way. I was kind of hoping you didn't have a d20 on hand. Oh, but uh, well, do you want to keep going with the bit or what'd you get? What'd you get? I got a 15. Okay, uh, you notice your legs have turned into a a, a, a fine vapor. <laughs> oh, okay. so oh, good. I yes, didn't need those a, anyway. Y- you're a genie, I guess. <laughs> All right. Well, that's not what today's magic item is about. Uh, Today's magic item was submitted by Dustin via Discord. And the item is called the Bottle of Concentrated Time. Mm. Exhaustion has always been the bane of academics the world over. Today, that ends. Harnessing the latest temporal extraction techniques, alchemists have managed to distill pure time. Each vial contains enough time for a one-hour period. The extraction process limits the effects to the imbiber, allowing the mind to experience nine hours of rest in a ten-minute period. Due to the temporal disconnect between mind and body, moving during these periods is not advisable, although reading a book is possible so long as page-turning is not required. (laughs) Previous tests have shown each movement may cause 1d6 psychic damage. Tests on casters have shown an 80% success rate in preparing a new set of spells. Unfortunately, due to the residual time lag, imbibers have been unable to tell which spells have been properly prepared until time of casting. Furthermore, taking more than the recommended dose of one vial per week is heavily discouraged due to the repeat doses having an opposite effect and slowing down the mind significantly. Test subject number one has only just recovered. (laughs) So, uh, this item, from the looks of it, is a, you know, a potion or whatever. A potion that you drink, and then over the next ten minutes, you experience nine hours worth of time. It sort of gives some ideas for what can be done with this time. You know, it says you can't physically interact with things, um, because, you know, you're moving super duper fast and they're still moving at the same speed, I guess. But, like, if you were to take a book and, like, tear out all the pages and just, like, put them up on the wall or something, you could read, you know, nine hours worth of reading in that ten minutes. Yeah. Um, It says that preparing spells can work, but you don't really get to, like, choose your spells, I guess. Huh. So maybe, like, I know Crit Academy had an episode where they... They propose that you like draw your spells prepared out of a hat. Like you put all your all of your known spells or like your spells in your spell book, put them in a hat, and then you pull them out at random. Maybe you could do something like that to actually determine which of your spells you prepared. Sure. Um, 
And then each it says each movement may cause 1d6 psychic damage. I would like to, to nail that down a little bit more exa as for exactly what that means. But I do like the idea of trying to interact with things that you can't interact with is possible, but causes you damage. Right. This is, yeah, this is really neat. Um, yeah. So I, I like the concept of bottle of, of distilled pure time. Sure, sure. Uh, I'm not 100% sure if Dustin intended the uh, Jim Croce reference or not. <laughs> It was the Jim Croce? He has reference? a song. He has a song oh, called "Time, Time in a Bottle." Bottle. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> um, but uh, I, yeah, I, I like. Okay, here's the thing. We talked about like time travel and such on uh, a couple of our bonus episodes a few mm -hmm. months ago. If I had a time machine, I guarantee you, I guarantee freaking to you, the number one thing I would use it for is when I wake up, I would go back in time a few hours. And, and go sleep back some more. Yeah, Just go, go back, back to, to sleep. sleep. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. That would be if there. If I if I could time travel. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, it, like, I would be afraid of you know going back in time and like messing up the timeline or whatever. Right. No, I just have a second bed and then just go back in time and go sleep in the second bed. <laughs> right. Yeah. <You know. laughs> right. Yeah. So you wouldn't interact with your exactly with your other exactly. self. <laughs> you just have a spare bedroom for for time sleep. Yep, and then when guests come over, no, 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 sorry, that's my that's my time bedroom. <laughs> that's the time. That's the time bedroom. <laughs> so, uh, oh, so I mean, I would definitely. That's what I would use this for if I could. If I could drink a potion and then experience nine hours in the next <laughs> ten minutes, I would just go to sleep. I call it the snooze button. It's a time machine. Yes, but uh... there you go. That's it. Right there. Right. <laughs> I could see the yeah. There could be some interesting uses for something like this. I mean, mecha yeah. mechanically, it's fairly limited, like, mechanically, but, like, like I could see the DM giving a party this, like, bottle and describing sure. basically what it is. Yeah. But it's like, this is the only one of its kind. Like, you have, this is definitely a very special thing that you have to choose wisely what you're going to use it for. Yeah. And it could be that, like, they, you know, they're on a time crunch, but they need to find some information. So, like, uh, like you said, they could tear the pages out of a book and read a whole book in ten minutes. Sure. And you know, the, the, trying to figure out, you know, they're trying to find the the magic word that opens up the that stops the ritual or something like that. I don't know. Like it. Yeah. It's like it is I, very. It's much more like plot or situational. Sure. In use. Um, Although I can see, you know, somebody would find a way to, to make, you know, to make like a power game use out of it. Yeah. If I were to put something like this in my game, I would, I would definitely have a couple things in mind that I intended them to use it for. Right. And then if they want to use it on something else, fine. I can come up with a different solution for whatever I had planned. Mm -hmm. But like, I, it would be weird to throw this in and just be like, yeah, just do whatever with it. You know? Right. Yeah. I, I would... I would probably try to engineer something that makes them be like, oh shoot, this is what we need. We need to use that, that bottle time for this. Yeah. Like the players already know they need to go on a time heist situation, not a time heist specifically, but they already <laughs> sure, know sure. they need to do this heist thing or this. Yeah. They, they have, they know what their plan is. They just need to get the tools to do it. And so, like, this is, like, th this is just, like, one of the tools that they have to go and find and get so that they can pull off this big heist or whatever. Sure. And so, like, they, like you, you know, you present it to them as, like, okay, this is a solution to this problem that you have. Here it is. You have to go and get it. Maybe there's a little mini adventure to go and get it, but here it is. Mm -hmm. But then you maybe present them with a different situation that it could also be used as a you know, solution for. Okay. Yeah. So like it is a one use thing and it's this it's this very specific thing like you you know you experience 9 hours in 10 minutes but you can't yeah. really move. You know like so like it has a very specific use. And you you know everybody's already sort of like you know gotten in their heads like okay yeah we got to we got to do this so we can read the the ancient text in a short amount of time that uh, you know otherwise the trap goes off and uh, cuz we have to we have to say the magic word but the magic word is in this big long text and anyway so sure, like, sure. but 
you could present them with another thing that they could use it for, and it's like, ooh, do we use it for this? Like, is there another way we can get around the magic door, the magic word door, or whatever? Yeah, you know, I don't. Yeah, no, I I think that's that's a great way to to do it. This does really feel like it would work best as a key to a specific, like an answer to a specific problem. Yeah. Um, if it was going to be just something you just threw in to do whatever with, I would want it nailed down a little bit more exactly how it works. Right. Yeah. Because especially if somebody's going to use such a powerful item just for whatever, <laughs> just I would want just a one time, uh, you yeah. know, prepare an extra spell or two. You know. I guess. Yeah. So it does make me think of the, there's the time stop spell, which depending on which edition of the game you're playing, it either does or doesn't stop time. Right. In third edition, it, it was called time stop and it functioned like you were stopping time. But the description of the spell was like, you're not actually stopping time. You're just moving really fast, which is a lot less cool in my opinion. Yeah. 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 Because I mean, like, but, there's uh, you know, there's spells that make you go faster. Yeah, they're not that fast, and it not, obviously it's not that fast. But like, flavor yeah. wise, it's like, oh, it's just an, you're just going. It's just like the, you know, it's just like the ninth level version of haste. You know? Yeah, pretty much. Super haste sounds a lot less cool than, than time, time stop. stop. Yeah. Which, so. which Elminster is immune to. Or is, <laughs> yes, I just remembered. We did talk about this on, you know, this is probably 100 episodes ago, but there was like, he lost the sack race, the potato sack race, because someone time stopped and he kept going and everybody else froze and he had to like go get back in his position so they didn't think he was cheating. Right. <laughs> right. That's anyway, right. Yeah, the anyway. potato sack race, Elminster's potato sack race. Yes. So, so yeah, I, I think that uh, this, it's a neat item. I would want a little bit more mechanics before using it. However, if it is put in as a solution to a specific obstacle, that would work pretty well. And like Jeff said, make the players have to decide whether to use it on that or to use it on something else. Right. That's yeah. really cool. Um, so anyway, that was uh, that was the bottle of concentrated time submitted by Dustin via Discord. Thank you, Dustin. Ding. Uh, Jeff, if anybody else wanted to submit magic items for the Dragon's Horde or questions for us to discuss or stories for the Funeral Pyre or Retirement Village, how would they get those to us? They could send us an email at interpartyconflict at gmail.com or join us on our interparty discord at bit.ly slash interparty discord. That's correct. And before we go any further, we have a giveaway to give away today. Woo. Today we're giving away a copy of Unearth Tips and Tricks Volume 2, courtesy of Crit Academy. Unearth Tips and Tricks Volume 2 is a great supplement full of character concepts, encounter concepts, monster variants, magic items, player tips, and DM tips. 25 of each of those from the Crit Academy podcast. It's a great supplement. Tons of great stuff in there for players, for DMs, everybody. Uh, it's great. It's a great you know, great thing. And it's awesome that Crit Academy is uh, letting us give this away. So, Jeff, who is our winner of this great supplement today? Today's winner is Sean C. Whoa, 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 winner. winner. Gobble, gobble, gobble. Yes. Congratulations, Sean C. You should be getting that in your email pretty soon. Uh, be sure to leave Crit Academy a review once you get it, whether you like it or don't like it. Uh, leave them a review so they can get more attention. They can know what to improve on in the future. Uh, it just, you know, it helps out everybody. So, uh, so be sure to leave them a review. I hope Crit Academy has gotten a, a, a new review every week from, from one of our listeners. So go out and do that, everybody. Hey. Uh, so big thank you to Crit Academy. Congratulations, Sean C. Jeff, if anybody else wanted to be like Sean C and win a free copy of this great supplement, how would they do that? They could do that by sending us an email at interpartyconflict at gmail.com with Unearth Tips and Tricks Volume 2 in the subject line. That's correct. Be sure to put Volume 2 in there. And then... Uh, Next up, I want to thank all of our wonderful patrons for helping keep the lights on. Patreon is an online platform. You can pledge to donate a certain amount of money per month to the creator of your choice. If you donate to us, we've got uh, on the lowest tier, we've got outtakes. We've got fantasy fiction that I've written. We've uh, on the next tier up, we've got bonus episodes, a monthly bonus podcast that we do every month. Uh, Interpatron conflict mm -hmm. for this month. We put out a bunch of our, uh, our favorite recipes, uh, at least one of which I have made since we recorded that episode. And a couple more I'll be making in the next, you know, in the next few days once once this episode goes out. So lots and lots of great, uh, um, great content on there. We also on the top tier currently, I, I want to address this. So we currently have a Roll20 game for our top tier patrons. I've mentioned that my work schedule is going to be changing in January. 
And so I don't know if I'm going to have time to keep putting on that game. I just want to say I am still going to be running a game in January. There will still be a January uh, Roll20 game for our top tier patrons. So if you are currently a top tier patron, feel free to, you know, do whatever you want with your pledge, but feel free to stay on that at least until January, because I'm going to use January as a way to tell whether I have time. I will definitely put on a game, but if I put on the game and then I realize, you know, I just don't have time for this, then we will work on restructuring the the Patreon and figure out what our, what our options are from there. Sure. So I know it's getting close to the end of the month. I didn't want anybody to be like wondering what we're going to do for January because they're trying to decide what to do with, uh, you know, with their pledge. Um, you'll have to worry about that next month, but for the time being, we're still going to do a game in January and then we will, we'll come up with an answer then. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so a big thank you to everybody who has continued to, to donate to us during these times with COVID, with, you know, the, with winter and Christmas coming around with uh, the uncertainty with our, our, uh, our Patreon, everything going on. I t- would totally understand if anybody wanted to cancel or reduce their pledge. But a huge thank you to everybody who has not. A huge thank you to everybody who has continued to to support us during these times. We really appreciate it. Like, yeah. Seriously, you guys are awesome from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you for all the support you've given us during, you know, ev- every day up until now. Thank you so much. Yeah. We want to keep on putting out good content and uh, worthwhile worthwhile content for everybody. So. Yeah, we, we appreciate you all. It's very... Yes, very, thank you very much. It, we, we enjoy doing this a lot and we enjoy... It, sharing it with all of you so thank you yes absolutely and then sorry i don't think i said where you can find our patreon if you go to patreon.com <laughs> slash interparty conflict that's where you can check out the rewards you can see what appeals to you and then uh, consider donating uh if you want to help us out uh, and get some cool stuff in return cool and then one more quick thing check out the other podcasts on the crit nation fellowship check out crit academy at critacademy.com justin ian and austin make new and reusable content for players and dms alike like I said, their 200th episode should be going out pretty soon if it's not out already. And uh, they've got lots of other, you know, tons of, of great content on that show regardless. Also check out Brute Force and Ignorance. They are an actual play podcast and D&D Character Lab where Garen and Dan made characters every week and pitted them against each other to debate whose characters were better. Enough of all that. Let's get into some questions, Jeff. All right. Our question f- comes from Ravel G on Ravel. Ravel? What do you think? I'm not sure. I hope I assumed Ravel, but uh, Rev- hopefully, Rev- hopefully that's close enough. Ravel, Ravel, Ravel. <clears throat> Our question comes from Ravel G on email, and they ask, "Where do you draw the line on homebrew rules? For example, I played in a group where modifiers didn't exist. How much can you change the rules of D and D before it's not D and D anymore?" Yeah, I think this is a this is a very good topic to to cover. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that. You know, a lot of people think of D&D as, and I mean, if this is all stuff we've, we've said on the podcast before. A lot of people think of D&D as being the end-all, be-all of role-playing games. Right. And, you know, a lot of people think of D&D as like, oh, you can do anything in D&D. And that's not wrong, but D&D isn't just, everybody should know, D&D is not the only role-playing game. There are lots of other role-playing games that are intended to do different things than D&D. Right. And so when you try to, if you try to sort of shoehorn in something that D&D isn't really meant to do, it it can kind of screw with the game. It, it can make the game a lot more work than it needs to be. Yeah. Whereas if you were to find a game that does some of those things naturally, it's going to be easier for you. It's going to be less work in the long run. Yeah. So like, yeah, when somebody wants to put something into D&D, that's not necessarily D&D. So like, I want to play a character that's a Jedi. Like, sure. I want to be a Jedi, but we're all playing D&D. So let's find a way to put Jedi in D&D where, mm-hmm. where I could just go and play one of the Star Wars RPGs. Like, I understand that like, not everybody wants to do that. Like people don't want to do that. They want, like, they like D&D. And they want to play D anD D, but they also want to do this cool, you know, you know, they want to bring in this cool other thing. Sure. And I could see somebody being like, like, like a brand loyalty thing. It's like, well, it's like I, you know, okay. like I'm a D anD D nerd. I got to play D anD D. Where, where it's like, you know, people who like Star Wars have to hate Star Trek, kind of thing. It's like, no, that's <laughs> okay. Not yeah. necessarily. 
doesn't have to be the case. But so it's like I want to, you know, I want to be true to D and D because that's where I started and this is where this is where I'm comfortable. But I also sure. want to do these other cool things. So let's find a way to, like you said, shoehorn in some new stuff. It doesn't quite work. So like I get like I get where I get where people are coming from on that. But sometimes it is just like yeah, you gotta just try just play a new play a, play a game that has those things because in most cases people have taken the time to make the balance you know to put the like to balance the game out to have the things that you want yeah but but i mean that that's not that's not the question though the question is like you know like where 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 would you draw the line and i guess one of the other things is like because you're brand loyal you've spent all because you spent all the money so yeah. what the heck is that term there's like the sunk sunken co- cost fallacy? sunken cost yeah yeah so like i've bought all of these books to to play D and D, so I've always I've put all this money into D and D, like I've invested in D and D. Yeah. So if I you know if I want to do this other thing, I like I feel like I have to do it in D and D because that's where all my money went. Sure, sure. Um, I'll I'll actually um, the, and I, I'm sort of dancing around the actual question. I'll get to the actual answering right. the actual question in a second, but um. I feel like a lot of now I don't listen to a ton of actual play podcasts. I really only have listened to a handful, but of the handful I have listened to, I feel like to an extent, some of them probably feel like they have to play. They have to quote unquote play D and D or else they're not going to get as many listeners okay, similar yeah. to brain loyalty or sunken cost or whatever. They think that if they, quote unquote play D D, if they start with a base of D D, it will get them more listeners because D D is so popular. Right. It'll get them more listeners than if they were to play the game that they would actually fit what they what it is they're trying to do. Mm-hmm. I've talked about the adventure zone quite a bit on oh, sure. uh, on this podcast. I don't know how much of it has made in made it into the finished episodes or not, but I I am not a fan of I, I've said before at least off the air or whatever, or, or in some of the uh, the Patreon stuff, I'm not a fan of the current campaign of the Adventure Zone. Okay. The reason being, I feel like it is not D&D because it's not using any of the rules of D&D because it is, it is so much based on the DM is basically just telling a story. The players are just kind of, follow, they're just kind of sitting at the table while the DM rattles off the story he wants to tell. There are so few dice rolls there are so few game mechanics. There's so little combat that it's bizarre to me that they call it D&D, especially because the previous campaign, the previous Adventure Zone campaign, uh, the Adventure Zone Amnesty, was not D&D. It was a, uh, it was a, a much more role-play-heavy system called, uh, I think it's Powered by the Apocalypse, I think is what the, the system itself was called. Hmm. And I guess a lot of people, when they did that season, dropped off. A lot of people stopped listening. And so when this can when this campaign came around, they made a big deal. We're going back to D and D, everybody. We're playing D and D. We're gonna play some some D and D ass D and D. I'm pretty sure is what one of them referred to it as at some point before the campaign started. Like uh-huh. it's gonna be about heroes. It's gonna be about heroes fighting villains. It's gonna be about you know character classes and and all sorts of D and D stuff. Come on back to the adventure zone. It's D and D because that's what you want to listen to. However, once it actually started, it became very clear it was not D&D and has been getting farther and farther and farther from D&D because this is me editorializing a little bit. I feel like the the DM specifically dislikes rolling dice or at least dislikes the the R O L E role of dice in a game. Right. Anyway, sure. I don't want to just sit here and complain about the adventure zone, but but <laughs> I'm using that as a point to say if they had played some other RPG. A lot of my complaints about the Adventure Zone graduation wouldn't be compl- I would not have that complaint. I would not be complaining about how little combat and how little dice rolling there was in whatever, you know, whatever RPG they were playing, whatever non non D&D RPG they were playing. But because they made such a big deal of playing D&D, it is very bizarre to me that they aren't sticking to any of what makes D&D D&D. Right. Because you can play a role playing game in the Forgotten Realms and have that role playing game not be D and D. Yeah, the setting is not what makes it D and D. I can play a game using the D and D rule set 
and set it in modern day. Might not be a good idea. I'll get to that a little bit later. But the rule set, this is arguable, but in my opinion, the rule set is what makes D&D D&D. Mm -hmm. You can play a tabletop RPG and you can call it D&D, but it is not Dungeons and Dragons if it isn't using at least... I'm going to throw a number out at least 80% the rules of Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> sure. If you have to cut out so much of the rules that, you know, more than, again, let's say 20% is is gone, I feel like it's not D&D anymore. Yeah. So, as far as, like, drawing the line on homebrew rules, if you are messing with the D20 roll, the D20 roll to determine success... If you are cutting out classes, if you are cutting out spells, mm -hmm. and if you are cutting out a uh, a fantasy setting, I feel like those things make it very hard to call it D&D. Not impossible, right. but very hard. Yeah. You're still playing a tabletop RPG, you know, yeah. but it's, but it is, it is a, you know, it is something kind of, you know, to an extent of your own making. Yeah. Um, fairly often I will see people on, you know, Facebook or on Reddit or whatever, saying things like, I really want to run a magicless game of D&D. Mm -hmm. And, okay. Oh, a magicless tabletop role-playing game? That sounds cool. A magicless fantasy setting? That sounds cool. But a magicless game of D&D? That raises some flags for me. Because so much of the... Like, okay, flip open your player's handbook. How much of the player's handbook is magic? <laughs> it's like the, a lot the, of it the back third you know you can you can play a non-magical character you can play a fighter a fighter isn't going to use the majority of that but to cut it out of the campaign entirely there's going to be some repercussions with that some things are not going to be balanced right yeah. and to you you can you can very carefully play around that so to you and to your campaign it might not be a problem I'm not going to tell you not to do it, but I do have to ask, why are you playing D&D if you're not using magic? You can, if you have an answer, awesome. Go for it. Play D&D &D yeah. without magic, but have an answer for that. Right. If it's just, oh, I don't want the players to feel like superheroes. Well, I mean, D&D &D is kind of built for the players to feel like superheroes. There are other ways, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't want to tell people how to play their game. Just, I do have to point out like, you're making it harder for yourself. Yeah. If you want the players to not feel like superheroes, if you want the players to not have access to magic, okay, fine. But D&D &D expects you to have all of those things. So to play a game without those is kind of not to not play D&D. &D, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I guess to an extent it depends on the edition. True. A bit. Because, uh, I mean, like, I could, I could see, like, you and your buddies play D and D all the time, and you're like, "Hey guys, why don't we spice things up? Why don't we just stick to no magic this time? You know, like yeah. and see how, and see how it goes." And like, I could see that still being D and D, but like you just kind of you're, but you are cutting out several classes, and like, and again, mm -hmm. depending on the edition, a lot of the classes, even the non magic classes, have like spell like abilities in some way. Like yeah. it's not just like it's not so easily explained with just like oh I'm just extra tough. Yeah. It's like no like you know one of the one of the barbarian specializations is like you you know summon a spirit <laughs> you know so like sure, you have to, sure. then you have to cut that out so you have to cut you know you have to cut parts like pieces and parts of even the not usually magical classes. So like you are you you know you do have to trim down a lot. Yeah. To to get it to that point so like you know it. It, yeah, it does. Again, beg the question. It's like how how much can you change before it's not D and D anymore? Yeah, I, I similarly like I see people asking like, oh, well, how would you play D and D without classes? We I think we might have even had a question like that on the podcast before. Yeah, and you know, being the the kind of the not really rule, being the pedantic person I am, I kind of have to say, uh, you can't because D and D has classes. You mm -hmm. can cut them out, but again. That's a huge section of the book, too. And that's a section of the book that far more players are going to be would have been using than yeah. the spell section. Right. That's it's so, so core to the game that mm. 
you know, again, I'm not trying to tell people how to play their game, but I got to be like, you're making it so hard for yourself. You are creating so many, you would have to create so many new rules yeah. in order to facilitate this one thing you're trying to do that you could find a classless RPG out there. Just go to Google and type in classless RPG and you know, they might not feel exactly like D and D you're going to have to make some, some concessions somewhere, but it would probably be easier to make a non D and D RPG feel like D and D than to make D and D into something that isn't D and D anymore. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like in, just... the, in the movie Armageddon, it's, it would have been easier to train astronauts to drill than it would be to train a bunch of drillers to be astronauts, but they did it anyway. Right. Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted you. Go on. <laughs> no, no, I was gonna, I was gonna agree with the. You had said, um, if you're gonna have to make a bunch of rules to make up for the ones that you got rid of, like, yeah, you're, you're yeah, you, you've, you've already created a different game at that point. Like, if you're, if you're tweaking D and D by, like, I'm gonna remove this and change this a little bit, and, and I'm gonna say, okay, let's not use this spell and this spell and this spell. Cause I, they're, I think they're too powerful or they don't quite fit into the narrative of the, of the world. I want to, I want to play the game in or something. Sure, sure. Or, you know, you might say, I want to tweak the way that this class works because I want a, like, because I have more, a more like story idea of why this class exists in this world or something. So like you can make, there are plenty of little tweaks you can make that help you fit it into your, into the game that you want the, the adventure or campaign you want to run. But yeah, when you start, removing big chunks of mechanics to the point where you actually have to make up completely new mechanics to make up for it because like you've created such a void yeah in the rules then then you then you have de- that you have definitely stepped outside of D. sure if it was something like i want to play i want to run a campaign of D, but i i want to cut out the sorcerer class mm-hmm. okay yeah th- no problem that that yeah. doesn't really raise any flags for me that's not a problem like yeah like like you were pointing out it's not you don't have to make up new rules for why the sorcerer doesn't exist yeah you just don't just don't have the sorcerer right same thing with any individual class you could even heck you could say i want a campaign that where the only class options are fighter cleric rogue and wizard sure cool awesome yeah but it's when it's when you take the leap to no classes yeah yeah i could see like you'd be like well I like I want magic to be there but like I I don't want any just any schmuck to be able to learn magic you have to be you know you have to have you know y- you have to be born into it so it's like I I want there sure. to be sorcerers but no wi- like cut out wizards like yeah magic is not book learned it is it is you are born into it and that's just what you want you know that's what you mm-hmm. want in your in your campaign yeah and I mean that's that's a cool idea too like that's not uh, that's not something that uh, I would have have any issue with my issue though because I have heard people come up with ideas like that the issue that i do have with that way of thinking though is when there have been people who have been like uh oh yeah i want magic to be rare in my campaign so when you make a character you have to roll a percentile and if you get lower than a 90 you can't play a magic character oh sure that uh I would draw the line there, not because I think that it's messing with the game. It's just, that's a bad rule. Isn't that's not that, fun. Isn't that something one of the Star Wars ones do? do? Like, it's like you have to know. roll and see if you're force sensitive or something. Maybe. So, Jeff, we did that Star Wars episode like a year and a half ago. I have forgotten 100% oh, no. of <laughs> the Star Wars content from that episode. <laughs> Oh, a no. few weeks ago at work, one of my uh, one of my coworkers was talking about uh, was talking about uh, something about this one of the Star Wars. He was like, asking me a question like, "Oh yeah, which Star Wars, whatever?" And I was like, "Dude, you're talking to the wrong guy. I know we did like a two hour episode about it or whatever." Yeah, too bad, it's gone. I forgot that we did that. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot that we yeah. did that. Yeah, I remember. I, I remember reading because I think we had like a there was a couple different RPGs we lo- went over, right? Uh, yeah, we went, we went over, I believe all of the star Wars RPGs. Yeah. And like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, I, I don't recall if, uh, that, that does sound like a, a thing that one of the star Wars RPGs might've had. Yeah. Uh, like that's um, definitely something I've heard, like, that is not unheard of in, in RPGs, but yeah, like that's, yeah. that's like that, that sounds really old school as far as tabletop going. Goes. Yeah. Like, like I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't object to that from you know like a a an importance of the rules standpoint i would argue just it's it's just not a good rule like i mean 
the point of the game is to have fun. If someone has their heart set on playing a uh, playing a spellcaster, it shouldn't be up to the dice whether they get to play in your game. You know what yeah. I mean? A player shouldn't be forced to play something they don't want to play just because they rolled badly. Like, yeah. if it is, if it's the result of something that happens during the game, if you know they fail a save or something like that, okay, fine. But the character creation should be up to them. I, for this, for the same reason, I'm against uh, rolling stats because I hate how one bad roll at the beginning of the campaign dictates what you're allowed to do for the entire rest of the campaign. I don't, I don't think that's good. Uh, that's good game design. I don't think that's good dungeon mastering. That's my opinion. I know some people will disagree with me, and that's fine. But I'm I'm very much against that that way of thinking for that reason. Mm-hmm. So, kind of kind of a tangent. Um, yeah, but the like the whole dice determining your character thing. Mm-hmm. Be, because I mean, like unless sorry if, sorry if I can just interject. Yeah, go ahead. Unless that's the point of the campaign. Sure. If the point of the campaign is we're going to roll randomly to determine what characters we get to play, okay, that's different. Yeah. Again, if you're if you're just trying to spice things up, if you're just trying to spice yeah. up your D and D, you know, table, like that's that's fine. Like you know, find ways to switch stuff up. If you're like if you're if nobody in your at your table can decide what they want to play because you've played everything, that's like yeah. what if we just roll random and then just kind of go try and make whatever we get work. You know, sure. Like that can be fun. Yeah, I'm down for that. But yeah, but like, you know, I'm the kind of guy who's like, I want to set up my character so it does a specific thing because I like, I just like the idea in my head that my character does this, you know, is really good at this one thing. And then the sure. dice don't let me do it. So like, yeah, I already hate that my, <laughs> like my fighter who is really good. I've put all of my points into him being able to wield this sword and I roll low all the time and never hit with my sword ever, ever, ever. And I was just like, well, that's really good crummy but i can at least i at least can like i at least can go in the fact that like okay my character is this fighter because yeah. i've chosen him to be a fighter and i'm gonna play him like a fighter even though he ends up with whiff, whiffing half the time sure. whereas like you know if it from the beginning i had rolled i mean i guess it's the opposite but like if i had rolled the dice and it, i had to be of uh a, a, a spell caster you know yeah if like if something was determining what class i had to be and i didn't want i didn't want to be that class i wanted to be the spellcaster or whatever so it's like it's like the more the more ways that that rolling dice can dictate what you play that just or like how how you how the game turns out for you i don't know there's there's too much randomness is what i'm saying yeah um but anyway yeah um and and this is coming from a person who i'm always down for playing whatever class the party needs or whatever. So like I'm not saying I always show up with a character that I need to play. Yeah. But if I get there and I'm told you don't get to play that because you didn't roll the right number or whatever. Yeah. That's going to take the wind out of my sails. So yeah, in the in the question it mentioned like play a group where modifiers didn't exist. Yeah. So um that would be weird. Um, so modifiers as in like they just didn't have stats. Or... They didn't say. I I'm imagining it kind of like everything is just determined by a straight d20 roll. Okay. Oh which, sure, sure. That's weird. However, I would have to actually play it to see how it it plays. I guess if it is designed like the reason I'm not immediately against it is because in D and D it's possible to play a character that all your modifiers are zero. You know what yeah. I mean? Right. Yeah. So. Although that is, again, that is weird, I would probably need, I would want to know what the DM had in mind for how it was going to play out and how long the campaign was going to be. If you're talking like, yeah, an epic campaign that's going to be, you know, like 20 sessions long or whatever. Yeah, no, count me out. That's That doesn't feel like D&D to me. <laughs> However, right. if it was like you start with no modifiers and then as we play you know, maybe some things happen and then now you have a plus one to something. Now you, whatever it, it, it still doesn't f- quite feel like D and D, but it feels, if it still has classes, it still has, oh boy. But then spell casting <laughs> and such would have to be different. Right. It's yeah. That's <laughs> yeah, man. I don't I don't know. Uh, again, it's that, it's that if you, if you remove something and then, it has it has a likelihood of having you have to like replace it with at least one other thing, if not more. Yeah. Like so, like you're removing modifiers, 
And it's like, all right, that's simple when you're when you're thinking about skills and attack and, and, and attacks. But like when you when mm-hmm. you start looking at all the other stuff, you know, you know, spells and other abilities, it starts to get more complicated. And you go like, okay, well, well, maybe for spells we can do this instead, and then may, but maybe for tools we could do this, or you know, I don't know. Yeah. <sighs> So when you have to when you have to start making whole new rules, the whole, whole yeah. new rule sets for uh, to replace something that you've changed or or removed, like that's when it like it starts becoming a different thing altogether. See, and that's that actually brings up an interesting point. So, for the most part, we've been talking about like taking things out of the game. Mm-hmm. Um, if I show up at a game and they're like, "Okay, yeah, we have all these extra rules," and then they hand me like a binder with you know a hundred pages worth of additional rules yeah i i don't think that's the game for me i was in a game a while ago like wait maybe like uh 12 or 13 years ago i think it was before my wife and i got married and um i was in a game where they had a binder with a few hundred pages worth of homebrew rules and most of them were just like some rules from this game some rules from this game some rules from this game just put them all in there and at the time I was like, oh, this is so cool. There's rules for like just about anything in here. And I thought it was great. But then we actually started playing and like I was only able to keep up with a tiny fraction of those of those additional rules. And the even the rules that I did get to that I did look at and I did like retain and everything. I was seeing things that were like, oh, well, this is completely pointless because this other thing is way better in every way and so on and so on. Yeah. So like I draw the line at homebrew rule. If you can't hand me one sheet of paper with all of your homebrew rules on it, that's that's where I start to draw the line. You have right. too many additional rules. You should be playing a different game if you have to <laughs> add that much to it. Yeah. Yeah, cuz yeah, if you're pulling if you're pulling bits and pieces from other games, yeah, you mm-hmm. you're going to run into a lot of redundancy and you're going to yeah. run into a lot of like like well, yeah, this like in this rule this rule set makes this rule set obsolete because like this is obviously better. It does the same thing but better. Yeah. But it's because they liked this one particular part of that rule. You know, they they wanted to put it in there. Yeah. So yeah, if you're <laughs> If you have to cross reference your own house rules, you know, it's like if you, yeah, if 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 one house rule refers to another house rule, it's 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 going to get it's going to get messy. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I I'm not trying to tell those people that they were doing it wrong. Sure. They they've been playing in that campaign for years and years, and I'm guessing that's it probably was a gradual process. They were like they were playing D&D. They were like, "You know, I think it'd be cool. I just read this new book. I th- it'd be cool if we added in this. And then, you know, I played a game in this other system. What if we just kind of cribbed some of these rules? And so it's not that they were doing anything wrong. For their group, I'm sure it was awesome. But yeah. as a newcomer, as a person who just doesn't have the time or mental capacity to memorize all of this stuff, I'm going to find one thing in there and I'm going to use that one thing and anything more than that might as well not be there. Yeah. And I mean, like, the newer books for D and D like they're, yeah, they're, they're not house rules. Cause the, the idea of house rules is that's the rules of just the sure, house that it's sure. played in. But I mean, like, you know, Xanathar's guide, you know, they're, they're adding stuff and like, yeah. you know, it's, you are, you are, you know, you are basically, you know, like if you, if you as the DM are like, okay, we're going to include every wizards of the coast publication. Sure you are basically giving them extra big extra binder of stuff to, to like learn. It's like, we're going to go off of these rules and these rules. It's like, if you want to, you know, we're going to do, we're going to do skill, we're going to do skill challenges and we're going to do Patriot. Like, so like you are giving them a lot of extra work, but at the very least, like those are all made specifically with D and D in mind and like to, to build on the rules, you know, to fit into them. Yeah. Um, I could, I could see someone, coming because like in our in our patreon games i tell everybody i think for this current one i was like uh, any wizards of the coast product was allowed in our previous patreon games i would say anything that was uh published in any way so like you couldn't use like D wiki but you could use anything on dm's guild and i'm not using that because it's it's uh it's definitely balanced or anything just for simplicity's sake if someone is really excited about something i want them to be able to use it 
Uh, but I could understand someone coming to our game and being like, oh, I don't like that at all. I don't think you should include all of those games or all, yeah. all those books. And, you know, that that's fine. That's their opinion. They're a lot, They're entitled to that, just like I'm entitled to, you know, complain about all of all of this stuff. <laughs> but, uh, you know, just my my personal way of, of viewing it is if it's it's much easier to accept just saying all Wizards of the Coast products than it is to say Wizards of the Coast plus this binder that I have of tons of other stuff that I've thrown in there, too. <laughs> um, so I, I don't know. <laughs> Ravel G, I don't know if this is <laughs> if we have in any way answered your question. So let me try it right now. There isn't a firm line when it comes to homebrew rules. Everyone's going to draw the line somewhere else. Right. For me, I kind of have to look at how much of the core mechanics of the game have you removed or changed? And really, it comes down to how much smoother does the game play as a result? Mm. Okay. If you have to read a whole bunch of extra stuff, it's not going to run. It's not that that's crossing a line, because in my opinion, that is detracting from the game in a way that, you know, the game already has enough stuff you got to read. Right. Then at the same time, if you cut out too much, you're going to have to supplement that with something. So again, you're forcing players to forget stuff and then read stuff to, to learn your additional rules. Yeah. There is not a firm line. So you won't, you won't know when you crossed it, but you'll eventually know <laughs> that you crossed it. Like, yes, there'll, there'll just be a tell us about you... it and I'll tell you that you crossed it. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you 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 will suddenly realize like, oh, this isn't D&D at all, but I mean, maybe <laughs> hopefully you're having fun though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you're having fun, that's the important thing. Don't let me tell you what should or shouldn't be D&D to you. Yeah. This isn't like a gatekeeping thing. Like, yeah. It's like, oh, this isn't D&D or you know, it's more it's it's more or less just a semantics. It it so, is semantics, yeah. And I I would even say like if I say that's not D&D that you're playing, I'm not saying that in a judgment sense, that's right. not a qualitative or, or it's not a qualitative definition. Like, no, no, you're not playing D and D you're playing your own game. And that's cool too. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I personally, I think quote unquote playing D and D is overrated. Not that I think D and D the game is D and D. The game is great. I think that playing tabletop RPGs is the best thing ever. And whether you are playing D and D or some other game that looks like D and D that's less important than the fun that you're having. Right, yeah. So, again, uh, <laughs> hopefully hopefully some of that made any sense whatsoever. All right. <laughs> anyway, so that'll do it for our regular questions, I think. However, we do still have our social media questions. Our last social media question was, if you had to make an entire adventuring party out of one class, what class would you choose? Bard. Bard, says <laughs> Jeff. I think I said, uh, I think I said Warlock. <laughs> but with me, Warlock, it's it was more about the role playing implications than the actual gameplay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, well, yeah. Bard, Bard was the Bard was the uh, the easy the easy. Choice. Bard is ab absolutely the easiest answer to that question. Go, because you could have a you could start a band. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> and mechanically, it would just be ridiculous. Of everyone, yeah, it, everyone it, it, supporting everybody else, it'd be good. Yes. Um, over on Facebook, Colin W says monk druid multi-class party, go, go power Rangers. <laughs> and I replied saying that, uh, in the, in that week's episode, we specified no multi-classing, but I guess the question didn't, the question itself didn't, uh, make that distinction. Sure, However, sure. it totally does. It says a single class and multi-class is not a single class. So right. Colin but W, I your answer is wrong, <laughs> but no, 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 but no, he's, he's, they're going somewhere. <laughs> yeah, but well, but then his response was monk druids are inherent rule breakers. <laughs> so, okay. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. All right. Uh, Adam B says completely dependent on setting and game, but let's assume forgotten realms and role play heavy, which is his preference. A party of wizards could be great fun. Yeah, sure. I can see that. That'd be, that'd be pretty cool. Especially if you all like, if if you are from like actual schools, like actual, you know, uh, a school that specializes in a particular thing, I like the idea of them each having a strong philosophy mm -hmm. based around their, uh, their school of magic. Yeah. Yeah. D different ways that they've learned magic, you know? Yeah. Like one could have just done it by straight book learn and the other one had Ooh. went out and did like field research and stuff. Sure. You know? Sure. Tom R says an all bard party could be pretty interesting. That's true. Mm-hmm. Uh, Justin H says clerics, their versatile domains pretty much means they can cover any job. Yeah. 
definitely yeah, the de- true as well. Yeah, yeah. the domain. A lot of some of the domains could get really get really cool at the later levels. Yeah. Uh, Alsar the Minotaur over on Reddit says, while classes like Paladin and Ranger can technically perform each adventuring party role, they leave something to be desired in some situations while excelling in others. Instead, I think I'd have to go Cleric, but Druid could work too. Either way, it relies on each class's versatility to adequately perform the various roles of Tank, Healer, DPS, and Control. Depending on their subclasses, they can perform admirably in each necessary role, with only marginal drop-off from a class designed expressly for that role. Hmm. Bards definitely get get an honorable mention, but I feel like to be a frontline bard requires spells and bardic inspiration, which eventually run out, while a cleric in heavy armor is always a cleric in heavy armor. Brought to you by Alistar the Minotaur the Munchkin. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't think we got anybody on Twitter. And then over on Discord, we got a few. Dustin says, Bureau of Bumbling Bards. No town is safe from their clammy hands. Oh, what? No. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Debrasaur says, OMG, I've played in the all bard one. I'd want warlocks where the patrons are competing against each other and using the party members as puppets, having all the players secretly undermining each other's goals. Yeah. Yeah. That was a, yeah. that was that a good works. one. Stiltskin Koopo 84 says all paladins because Voltron always wins and he has a team of five of them. <laughs> Actually, there is a D and D themed episode in the Voltron series on Netflix, and it is probably my favorite depiction of D and D and other media. Oh, cool. I'll have to check that out. I was not aware of that. Yeah. Uh, Peace Roy Pancake says, I mean, clearly an all cleric party is the best party. Am I right? Who needs charm or stealth when you can clank your way through encounters and always have the higher moral ground, at least from your own perspective. <laughs> right. <laughs> she might be referring to in our Patreon game. I, at one point, I think the party was, I think there were four clerics. <laughs> uh, and, and then one of the, one of them had to drop out, but it's, so now it's three, it was three clerics and a, a ranger, I think. Oh, okay. Or something. So, uh, the beverage tea says I'm with PJP, all clerics, same or different deities. It doesn't matter. The domains are flexible enough to cover all the bases and the flavor can range from God talk to the Spanish inquisition to Jehovah's witnesses with crossbows. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, Floofy Shub says, my first inspiration along this line was for a pirate ship where all the pirates on board were Pathfinder summoners. Evolutionist summoner has to be my favorite class post second edition. I think I talked about, uh, um, I, it's, it's probably not, uh, not directly related, but I talked about making a, a pirate captain that was a summoner in Pathfinder. Right. <laughs> you're you're going to make it so that your summon was your boat. <laughs> yes. Yeah, he, he summoned a, a ship of the damned. It was a, it was a very small ship. That he would just kind of sit on top of. But, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I think that's all of them on Discord. So yeah, that was uh, that was our last social media question. Thank you, everybody who wrote in. Mm-hmm. And our next social media question is going to be a real simple one. What's your favorite cantrip and why? Mm. I feel like I have an answer for this, but I just can't think of it. While you're thinking, I'll chime in and say, um, this is actually inspired by, I keep mentioning Crit Academy this week. I just listened to um, one of their most recent episodes. They talk about a supplement that beefs up cantrips. Because currently in 5th edition, with your your cantrips, as you level up, if they are a damaging cantrip, they get more damage as you mm. level up. Yeah. Um, that's That's fine. That's not very interesting, but that's fine. But also, the ones that aren't damaging cantrips get nothing. Right. And so yeah. there's a supplement where it basically it doesn't take every cantrip, but it takes like 15 or 20 of them or something. And it gives you additional effects for them as you level up. So with something like Ray of Frost, you've got the basic effect where you deal damage and you reduce the target's speed. But then when you get to like level five, um, maybe the range gets longer. Maybe uh, as you get to a higher level than that, maybe instead of just freezing the target, you leave difficult terrain on the ground or something yeah. like that. And so I just, I really, really liked the different effect because it's not just damage. It's like, oh, you do this, it gets rid of this limitation or it does this thing that the spell couldn't do otherwise. Like Mage Hand, when you get high enough of a level, you can, it can hold a sword and attack using your spellcasting modifier once per round. Mm-hmm. And like, that's awesome. That's something a, a 17th level wizard should be able to do. Absolutely. Yeah. So that got me thinking like cantrips can be awesome. I know this, this supplement is not core. Of course, it's not core rules, of course, but uh, <laughs> it just group. got me excited about cantrips. So, um, 
yeah, I'm trying to think what's a what's a good one. Oh, <laughs> I kind of like I like vicious mockery. Okay, it's a good one. I guess it's because it's like I, I just like it just because it's like you're you're just kind of like you're slinging insults at them and it just does a little yeah. bit of damage, you know? Or like I think yeah. it does damage and like gives them a disadvantage on something. I can't remember. Uh, it gives them a disadvantage on their next attack. Right. So it's like, it's a D4 damage. So like basically nothing, but then it Mm -hmm. could give them disadvantage on their next attack. Like, and so you're just, you're, you're demoralizing them. You're insulting them. You're just like, (laughs) I like, it's like, you're gonna lose, you know? Yeah. So uh, like, there's a lot of, there's a lot of good cantrips and there are some that can be broken. (laughs) Oh, sure. Sure. Um, but I don't know that, that one flavor wise, I kind of like, uh, I definitely liked for my little, my sassy old, uh, half halfling character i made once yeah it's definitely a good spell um i would say so i mean prestigitation is the that's the cheap answer everybody <laughs> loves prestigitation because there's just so many things you can do with it um i was i was not gonna say prestigitation i was actually gonna say arcane mark until i realized that that's not in fifth edition that is now just part of prestigitation right it used to be there used to be a cantrip you could cast that you would touch a creature or a surface or an object and you would put a unique mark a a mark unique to yourself so like your emblem you would permanently put it on that creature or object or whatever i mean magic could get rid of it but it it would persist forever unless something dispelled it and you could choose to have it be um visible or invisible and then there were there were Later spells you could cast that would affect something that you had previously put your mark on. So yeah. you could like invisibly mark something and then later on summon it to you using a later spell. Right. So I really liked the idea of arcane mark. Like I said, it's not really a thing in fifth edition. It's kind of just part of press digitation. Yeah. It's um, more temporary, right? Yeah. And s- since I don't want to just say press digitation, cause again, that's the cheap answer. I think I will probably, I will actually probably say Ray of Frost. I think that it's um, it's a it's a cool thing. I, I almost never see anybody take it, including myself. I almost never take it myself. Uh-huh. But I like the idea of freezing the target and slowing them down because now they're like either covered in ice or they are, you know, physically slower because they're just freezing and where they stand, <laughs> you know. So so I like that one. I will change my answer to create bonfire. Oh, OK. That's a good one. That one's in uh, Elemental Evil. Um, yeah. but I do like that one a lot because you can create a light source. It's a bonfire. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You can create, it's a bonfire. So you can use it for cooking. You know, you could just create, you create a bonfire. You can use yeah, it for whatever you could make, use a bonfire for. Yeah. You can make a camp. Uh, you also like you create it in an area. So it is, uh, and like if you cast it in an area that somebody's in, like if somebody, if you put it in somebody's square, they get a save to like kind of jump out of it basically. Yeah. So like, you know, it, it, it's not a really good attacking spell, but like you could still use it offensively. Sure. Um, but then you can also kind of like zone somebody out. Like, so if somebody walks through that, they have to make that save again. Mm -hmm. So like you could kind of like, you know, you could block an area off with this bonfire. So it's like, it's like a little, it is just a square of fire that you can move around, you know, at the cost of just an action but not yeah. a, not a slot cause it's a cantrip. So I don't know. I, I think it just has a lot of good uses. Cause like, you know, you got, you got your light source, you got, you got zoning, you got, you know, a f- a offense, you got defense with it, you know, and, and then you got utility with it as well. And it's all just, you're just creating a fire. Sure. Yeah. No, I think that's a, that's a pretty good one. It's got all sorts of different uses and it's not, it's not as obvious of an answer as prestigitation. Sure. All right. Well, hopefully uh, some of our listeners out there have um, some interesting responses. I, I mean, I, I expect a lot of Eldritch Blasts and that's fine. <laughs> I don't really, personally, I don't really think Eldritch Blast is that great unless you're a Warlock. Well, because Warlocks get a bunch of additional effects they can put on it. Yeah. Because I was going to say when you were talking about the the supplement that adds like extra stuff to to two uh, cantrips, like mm-hmm. it'd be cool that if there was like a wizard specialization or like a different class altogether that basically was just cantrips but then you take different abilities to make each cantrip better like you have like oh like like a skill tree for each yeah. cantrip in a way but then i was like well that's kind of is what warlock is with just with eldritch yeah. blast yeah 
Yeah, I don't know. Hey, somebody go make a DMs Guild supplement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That'll do it for our questions for today. Uh, but before we close out, let's uh, let's wind down. Let's take a deep breath. <sighs> let's remember those who have come before us, who have given their lives so that we may have a better world to live in as we toss another log onto the funeral pyre. Today's funeral pyre was submitted by Redwood Riadra on Reddit. Say that three times fast. Uh, um, and they say, so back in high school, early 90s, a small group of students formed a D&D club, second edition. We made our characters. Mine was a pretty standard fighter using a bastard sword. The DM then opens the first scene with a combat. I get initiative, roll to attack, and get a one. The DM pulls a cheap stapled booklet out of his backpack, saying he wants to use these cool critical hit-miss yeah. tables he found. Critical's not being an actual rule in second edition. Roll percentile dice. Look it up on the table. Critical hit to yourself. Roll percentile dice again. Decapitation. So on the very first round, in fact, the very first action of the entire campaign, my character, nominally an experienced warrior, cut her own head off. <laughs> Memorable, yes, also enshrined me for the utter stupidity of fumble rules. <laughs> and yeah, so that I, I probably cut it out, but I mentioned to Jeff right before this segment that I feel like we've had this story before, but no, I'm pretty sure it's just a lot of people have encountered this. Before. Right, yeah. <laughs> so let's raise a glass as I say, don't use critical fumbles. Clink. Clink. All right, that'll do it for today. To submit questions for us to discuss, items for the Dragon's Horde, or stories for the Funeral Pyre, please email us at interpartyconflict at gmail.com. For show notes, links to media mentioned on the show, and running lists of questions and magic items, go to interpartyconflict.com. Join the discussion on social media. Find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash interpartyconflict, on Reddit at r slash interpartyconflict, or on our interparty Discord, or on Twitter at inpartyconflict for our weekly social media questions. Your answers might end up on the show. You can check us out on iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, YouTube, Spotify, anywhere you download podcasts. Please rate, review, subscribe, or just tell a friend. If you want to support the show monetarily, check out the rewards at patreon.com slash interpartyconflict. We have a few different tiers, so anything you can spare, even a dollar a month, would go towards making the show better, and you'll get bonus content for it. Jeff, tell us about FriendQuest. FriendQuest is our YouTube channel where we play video games, or you can come watch me play games live at twitch.tv slash tiltedtortle. Yes. Also, head over to bit.ly slash interpartyconflict to take a short survey about our show, what you like, what you don't like, etc., and just for taking it, you'll get two free printable board games, courtesy of Mary and Tom over at hollandspiel.com. And our music is made by Boxcat Games from Nameless, the Hackers RPG. So, Jeff, until next time... Gabe, what happens when I roll a one on outros? Decapitation. <laughs> oh, no! Oh, <laughs> no!